What's up guys, Blue Bear here, and today I will be going over yet another custom build that was ordered last week. This one will be going to a fellow moderator of the Budget Magic Group on Facebook, so naturally this will be a budget build. They wanted a deck to go with their secret lair version of Massacre Girl that they purchased with a budget of up to $80. So let's take a look at what Massacre Girl does before we get into how I went about building out the 99 for him. This is the version that he got in one of the secret lair drops. It's pretty cool looking, and I can see why he wanted to use it. She is a 5 mana 4-4 four four legendary human assassin with menace, and a unique second ability that when she enters play, each other creature gets minus 1, minus 1 until end of turn. Then, whenever a creature dies that turn, each other creature gets an additional minus 1, minus 1 until end of turn. So in a sense, her ability cascades every time a creature dies on the turn she enters play. That makes her a pretty nasty board wipe tribal candidate, which is what direction I decided to go in for the build. I mentioned last week that this build would be somewhat similar to the jewelry build I released on the channel last week, and while that is true, this build has some key differences which I will go over for you now, starting with the lands. One quick side note though, there were a few cards in this person's collection already that they wanted to include, so I'll mention that when I come across them. So we're in mono black. What that means is that there weren't a lot of choices for utility lands as far as this set goes that weren't monetarily out of reach, so I'll show you what I came up with for the build. We're going to do the cycling lands because we always need to draw more cards whenever we don't need the extra land. So Baron Moore starts it, Polluted Mire, and Desert of the Glorified are the three that are available to us in those colors. I got a Moral to Glory in here, it enters tapped, adds a black, and then you can sacrifice it to return target creature from a graveyard to your hand. That's useful in instances where a creature can't return itself from the grave, which is what this deck wants for the most part. So it helps do that. I have a couple of quote-unquote main lands in here, and the reason for that is this deck wants to destroy the board, wipe it all out. What's left over will be things that weren't creatures. So lands that turn into creatures are great because you can get extra damage in as you're doing it. The first one is Hive of the Eye Tyrant. You can come into play untapped if you, what is it, two or more other lands. So that's good. Taps out of black. And then you can pay four. And then until end of turn, it becomes a 3-3 Beholder with Menace. And whenever this creature attacks, you can exile target card from Defending Player's Graveyard, which can be very useful for anti-graveyard shenanigans, which we are. So it's kind of ironic that this is in here. Next one up is Crawling Barons. It is actually one of the better cards in here, and you won't reckon like you wouldn't think so. But when I was testing this out, I actually found that this card won the game more times than anything else. So it adds a colorless. You can put four into it to give it two plus one plus one counters, and then it will turn into an elemental creature that's a zero zero. So the counters are where its power and tons come from. <clears throat> one of the cool things about this is it's for every four you put into it, you can put two plus one plus one counters on it. When I was testing it, I was able to actually activate that ability a couple times per turn and then attack, making it bigger, you know, big enough that it could do some serious damage. Mistress Factory adds a colorless, and then you can pay one to make it a 2-2 Assembly Worker, and then it can tap to give an Assembly Worker plus one plus one. Now, normally in Commander, that's not really that great because you can have more than one Mistress Factory, but I included Urza's Factory for the little synergy there. It taps to add a colorless, but then you can pay seven into it to create a 2-2 Assembly Worker, and this actually is helpful for defense purposes and for offensive purposes if you keep clearing the board and you, you're the only one that can create a creature, or, you know, if it's later in the game and people don't have any cards in their hands, you still have the ability to make creatures. Encroaching Waste, because by now you should know that I include at least one type of land destruction in every deck I make. This is the one that's usually in there. Terramorphic Expanse, and of course, Evolving Wilds for that getting lands out of your deck so that you don't draw them later. As far as the basics go, the person who's getting this deck wanted to use their own basics, so I didn't include them in the video or in the package that I'm sending them. So if you want to see how many there were open spots for it, just go ahead and use the link in the description of the video below. Moving on, we'll do the Rocks. We're in mono black, so there is no ramp except for in artifacts. So we'll start off with a soul ring. It's just good stuff. Everybody includes one. I only include it in my non pre con style budget stuff. It's only for custom orders do I ever include them, just because I don't have enough to do that for every pre con I make. Mindstone, two to cast, attach data cardless, sack it later, draw a card, all good utility. Heraldic banner, three to cast, you choose a color when it enters. Most likely black, since that's pretty much what you're doing here. It's mono black. And then it gives all creatures you control that chosen color plus one plus zero, and then it can tap to add that color that you've chosen as a mana rock. Ominous Parcel, one to cast, two, tap and sack it, search your library for a basic land, reveal, put into your hand, it'll thin your deck out of lands for later better draws, but what I found when I was testing is that I used the second ability, which is five, tap and sack it to deal four damage to target creature. This deck is all about killing things anyway, this deck, or this card just fits the deck very well. Expedition Map, one to cast, two, tap and sack it, search your library for a land card, reveal it and put it into your hand, that could be any land in your deck, and that could be a main land if you needed, it could be something that cycles in case you want to draw a card, it doesn't matter what it is. You can do it. And if the person who gets this later wants to upgrade to other things like a Volrath Stronghold, which is a reserve list $80 card that fits the theme of this deck, they could do so. Armillary Sphere, two to cast, two tap and sack. Search the library for up to two basic lands and put them in your hand, so even more stuff coming out of your deck so you don't draw them later. 
the Colleges Terrarium to the cast. It comes into play, you search your library for a land, put it in your hand, and then later you can pay two, tab and sack to put a plus one, plus one counter on a creature. As a sorcery only, sadly. Moon Silver Key, uh, two to cast, one tap and sack. Search your library for an artifact card, like a soul ring with a mana ability, or a basic land reveal put in your hand. So it actually could be useful in a lot of different, different situations. I believe Urza's Saga itself is searchable with this. And then the last ramp card is going to be Solemn Simulacrum, or Sadbot, if you will. It's for to cast for a 2-2 creature. It has an enter and leaves the battlefield ability, which is really good. In a deck like this, you want as many things that enter and leave uh, the battlefield abilities that have them as possible. So this one comes into play, search for a basic land, put in the play tapped, and then when it dies, you draw a card. So pretty good stuff for this kind of deck, but I know that a lot of people use this for a lot of decks, so it's just good utility. Moving on to the creatures, there are a couple in here that the person who, uh, who's getting the deck owns, so I'm going to superimpose them in as we go. Uh, you'll notice in this section that there's it's going to be very similar to the jewelry deck that I had presented last week. There's going to be a lot of similarities here, and the reason for that is this is a purely chaotic, kill all the stuff on the board kind of a deck, and you want to be able to be resilient and get those back. So we start with Clay Revenant. It's one to cast for a 1-2, enters tapped, and then you can pay three to return it from your graveyard to your hand, and a lot of the creatures in here will do that. So we start with Clay Revenant. Sanitarium Skeletons, it's very similar to the, to the Clay Revenant, except for it doesn't enter tapped, and it costs a black instead of colorless. Persistent Specimen, it's one black for a 1-1. One, one. You can pay three to return it from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped, and that returning to the battlefield tapped will be important later when I go over a, the very last thing that I'm going to go over. So I'm going to put that aside for now. Uh, Tenacious Dead, one to cast 1-1, one, one, that when it dies, you may pay a black and one generic to return it to the battlefield tapped. Reassembling Skeleton, another card I'm going to put aside. It's two to cast for a 1-1, one, one, and you can pay a black and a generic to return it from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. And I'll put that aside because that will be important too. Durable Coil Bug, two to cast for a 2-2. Two, two. You can pay five to return it from your graveyard to your hand. Brood of Cockroaches, it's 2 to cast 1-1 one, one that is, when it dies, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, this has been changed to when it dies. So when it dies, you can pay a life and return it from your graveyard to your hand at the end of turn. Endless Cockroaches, 3 to cast, and it's a 1-1. One, one. And when it dies, return it to your hand. Haunted Dead, another one from last week's deck. 4 to cast for a 2-2. Two, two. When it enters, you make a 1-1 one, one spirit, a flying spirit, which is important because there's not a lot of flying in this deck. And then you can pay two, discard two cards to return it from your graveyard to the battlefield. And the important part here is that the synergy between all these guys is that they all help each other return. So you can have two guys that can return to your hand from your graveyard to pay for that cost and still get them back later. So it's pretty good synergy there. And the last one that'll do this uh, returning itself is Necro Savant. It's three black and three for a 5-5. Five, five. That power toughness could be useful later because if you can keep getting something that's that big back, you may be able to win with combat damage. Its uh, ability is for two black and three of any. You can sacrifice a creature to return it from your graveyard to the battlefield. But you can only activate that during your upkeep. The next section will be the same as last week's. The guys that come into play and people's, every player has to sacrifice something. Merciless Executioner makes everybody sacrifice a creature. I think all of them do that. Uh, Fleshbag Marauder also sacrifice a creature, every player. Slum Reaper... Everybody sacrifices a creature, except for it's a 4-2 instead of a 3-1 like the last two. Demon's Disciple. Each player sacrifices a creature or a Planeswalker. And Playcrafter. Everybody sacrifices a creature or a Planeswalker. And each player who can't do that has to discard a card. We've got the next two will actually be technically ways to partially win. So Blood Artist. Two to cast for an 0-1. And whenever it or another creature dies, target player loses life and you gain a life. And the next card is the same. It's a... Uh, Falcon Wreath Noble, it's 4 to cast for a 2-2 flyer that does the same thing. The only thing I would suggest is, I was looking for Agent of the Iron Throne to replace the Blood Artist with, because it's an enchantment, and since it's an enchantment, it can't die to creature removal. It can die to enchantment removal, but, you know, it's neither here nor there. The fact of the matter is, is that you kind of want the ability for these two cards to be on something that's not a creature. But the problem is, some of those cards are very pricey and hard to get a hold of. I, I don't have a whole lot of them, so I use creatures for now. When the person who's receiving the deck gets it, they can look at that. I just didn't have any on, on hand. Next section of creatures will be ones that benefit highly from all the death and destruction going on. White of Precinct 6 is actually a pretty good card for this deck. It's 2 to cast 1-1, one, one, and it gets plus 1, plus 1 for each creature card in all of your opponent's graveyards. So, that's important, because this guy can get really big, and if for some reason there's no other creatures on the board, I wonder why, this guy can actually be a one-hit wonder. It could actually do enough damage. If there's enough creatures that have died in the game, it could hit pretty hard. Morbid Opportunist takes advantage of, obviously, it's an opportunist. Whenever a creature dies, draw a card, but it only triggers once per turn. Uh, this card I'm going to superimpose is Pitiless Plunder. It is 4 to cast for a 1-4, and whenever another creature you control dies, create a colorless treasure artifact token. So I'm going to put that aside because that is another important one, and I'll just superimpose that in later. Next up we have Murderous Rider. It's a 3 to cast, 2-3 Life Linker that when it dies, it can be put into the bottom of your library. So it's not the same as the other guys because you can't really control where it's going to go, but at least it comes back. It has an adventure. The adventure is 3 to cast, and it as a sorcerer, I'm sorry, instant. At instant speed, you can destroy target creature or planeswalker, and you lose 2 life. So it's creature and artifact removal, and then it can become a 2-3 
lifelinking creature that can come back eventually. Whisper Blood Liturgist, Forticast for a 2-2. His ability is to tap and sack two creatures to return target creature from your graveyard to the battlefield. I like this guy. When I've tested this deck, this guy was a superstar as well. So you use the guys that keep coming back to sacrifice to it to bring something that does not have the ability to return itself back into play. Sir Conrad the Grim, probably the best card in this deck. So it is 5 to cash for a 5-4, so good stats for its mana cost. Mana value, mana cost, whatever you want to say. Has two very important abilities. This guy is the game ender. This is one of your win cons. So whenever a creature dies, or... A creature card is put into a graveyard from anywhere other than the battlefield. So anytime a creature is put into the battlefield, whether it's from the library, from the hand, from the battlefield, th those two parts will affect it. And then the last one, uh, the third thing is, or a creature card leaves your graveyard. It deals one damage to each opponent. So all those guys that keep coming back trigger Sir Conrad, making all of your opponents lose a life. Pretty important. Then he has another ability that says each player put mills one card from the top of their library. Uh, from their, ugh, it's mills one card. This has all been said that each player mills one card. Probably the best card in the deck. Last card, I don't have to superimpose this, is, is Massacre Worm. They actually had this and wanted this. This is actually how the deck came to be and how the idea for the deck came about. This is one of the major cards, is Massacre Worm. Three black, three of any for a 6-5. When it enters the battlefield, all creatures your opponents control get minus two, minus two until end of turn. And then whenever a creature and opponent you can, uh, whenever a creature and opponent controls dies, that player loses two life. So it's a quasi-board wipe, and I'll have a bunch of them in here. When he's in play, anytime a creature dies on your opponent's side, they lose two life. So this is another partial win cons. So the two together actually work very well in tandem. So Massacre Worm and Sir Conrad are two of your win cons. Up next, I'm going to go over... It's basically your spells for the deck, but this is utility and spells. Uh, and I'll have another section for utility after that. But this is the spells for the most part. There are some more spells after this. This is all removal. This is all the death and destruction that this deck wants to do. We'll start off with what I call sweepers. They're not truly sweepers because they don't say destroy all creatures. The problem with that in black is... They cost monetarily a lot. Damnation is a lot. And some of the other ones that are cheaper, because I make so many decks, I kind of ran out of them. So if anybody has any they want to send me, some black you know, sorceries that destroy all creatures, I wouldn't be mad at you. I've just ran out of them. Uh, so we start with the sweepers, and they all do a similar effect of giving a minus power and minus toughness. Mostly minus two, minus two, some minus four, minus four. So we start with Infest, which is just a 30 KS one that does that. Gives them all minus two, minus two. Drown and Sorrows gives them minus two, minus two, and then you can scry one. Pestle and Haze gives them minus two, minus two. Or you can remove two loyalty counters from each Planeswalker. Golden Demise gives you, can give you the City's Blessing if you had the 10 permanents. And then if you do have it, it's a bonus. But it gives all creatures minus 2, minus 2 until end of turn. However, if you have the City's Blessing, it only gives your opponent's creatures minus 2, minus 2 until end of turn. Rising Miasma gives them minus 2, minus 2. And you can pay the Awaken cost and make one of your lands a creature if you want. Don't really suggest that. Massacre can be cast for free if an opponent's playing white and they have a Plains in play. Binding Rain gives them minus 2, minus 2. And it can be paid for Madness if you have to discard it. But there's nothing in this deck that makes you discard it. So it's just a blanket minus 2, minus 2 for 4. Languish gives everything minus four, minus four. It's one of the bigger ones. And then Feast of the Succession, uh, six to cast to make all creatures get minus four, minus four until, until end of turn, and you become the Monarch. And if you have any questions about the Monarch, because I'm sure you will, a lot of people do, just send me a, uh, either a message or put it in the comments, and I'll put the actual rulings for Monarch in this uh, comments section. Targeted removal time, go for the throat, kills a non-artifact creature. Infernal Grass kills any creature, but you lose two life for two at instant speed, which is one of the better removal spells lately. Artless Act. This actually is a really good removal spell. Lately, a lot of people are doing Infect, so not so much, but before the Heavy Infect was a thing, it destroys a creature with no counters on it or removes three counters from a target creature. Anoint with Affliction. It has Corrupted. This deck doesn't deal with Corrupted because there's no poison in this. If your opponents are playing it, it would benefit you in this card, so it actually exiles a creature with mana value three or less, or if they have three poison counters, it just exiles a creature. Doesn't matter. No caveats to it. Eliminate destroys a creature or planeswalker with mana value three or less. The only real... I can't think of a lot of planeswalkers that are three or less that are too important other than Oko, but in Commander, it's not really that big of a deal. Oko's not that as powerful in Commander. Victim of Night destroys a non-vampire, non-werewolf, non-zombie. Walk the Plank kills a non-merfolk. Murder kills anything. <clears throat> Poison the Cup kills anything. You can foretell it, and then if you foretell the card, you can scry two. So, always nice. And Assassin's Inc., for the cast instant that destroys a creature or a planeswalker, but it gets less if you control either or an artifact or an enchantment, and you can and will, because the long reach of night, one of my last superstars that I have here. It doesn't look like it, but this is a superstar in this deck. It's Fortecast Saga. Chapter 1s and 2. Each opponent sacrifices a creature unless they discard a card, so more death and destruction. But then it flips on the third chapter. And on the third chapter, when it flips, it turns into a 0-4 menace. Uh, what's it called? Animus of Night's Reach. That whenever it attacks, target it gets plus X plus zero into end of turn where X is the number of creature cards in defending player's graveyard. It's akin to White of Precinct 6, sort of. 
not exactly, but this is a superstar. When I was testing this, uh, this in the deck, this was an accidental inclusion because I was just looking for more removal when I was testing it because Arena does not have all the cards that are in this deck, so I had to fill it in. And when I was playing it, I realized that this card actually ends games. Not quickly, but it can end some games. It can hit pretty hard in the right circumstances, and those circumstances did come up, so keep that in mind. Moving on, we're going to go into the pure utility section. So that was all removal. This is the pure utility stuff. So card draw, village rights. Obviously, you have sacrificial lambs all over the place and some of the creatures you have that they just return back to the, either your hand or the, into play for a cost of some sort. So why not take advantage of that by drawing cards and sacrificing them? So village rights, daily dispute. You also get a treasure token when you do it. Reckoner's bargain. You can gain life and draw two cards. Diabolic Tutor, because we have to have some kind of tutors, and in a budget deck, this is one of the better ones. However, the best one for this deck is Final Parting. It lets you search your library for two cards, put one in your graveyard and one into your hand. What do you think you're going to put in your graveyard? I don't know. Maybe any of the creatures that return themselves? It's actually a superstar, too. Alright, Anointed Procession. Two to cast enchantment. Whenever one or more non-token creatures die, you can create a 2-2 zombie with Decayed. This ability only triggers once a turn, however. Everything you have in here has sacrifice stuff. You have stuff that returns back from the graveyard to play, so you can actually get a bunch of different tokens out when you need to, and it's good synergy. Phyrexian Reclamation. This is one of the cards that the person receiving the deck had, and it's actually a good inclusion. It's a one to cast enchantment that you can pay a black, one generic, and two life to return target creature from your graveyard to your hand. There's a lot of synergy there. All those cards that can't return themselves back, you can now get back just for paying a little life, and you will get some of that back, because I'll show you in a, in a minute. There is another card in here that actually will get you some life back. Rise of the Dark Realms. This was a card they hadn't wanted to have in there. I didn't personally want this card in there. I couldn't fit it in, but they wanted it, so I figured, why not just throw it in there? I know why they want it. I see how it works and why it would work well. I just had other options that I wanted to choose, but I put it in anyway. It's 9 to cast, and you put all creature cards from all graveyards onto the battlefield under your control. I get it. There's a lot of death going on, so you want everybody's creatures. I just had other aspirations for a card spot for this, but I put it in there. They're going to let me know how it plays. When I tested it, I did not draw this, so I can't actually... Tell you how well it's going to do. Oops. All right, Professor Onyx is the card I was talking about earlier where you'll gain some life. Professor Onyx is a 6 to cast Planeswalker. It's a Liliana. Comes into play with 5 loyalty counters. Has Magecraft, and this is where the life gain is going to come in. Whenever you cast or copy an instant or sorcery spell, each opponent will lose 2 life and you will gain 2 life. Okay, so this is a partial win con. It will drain your opponents. It will give you some life that you so de desperately need with to use for Rexian Reclamation or to stay alive. And then it has other abilities. It's a Planeswalker, so its first uptick is you lose a life. You look at the top three cards of your library. You put one of them in your hand, the other two in your graveyard. I've used this card in testing, and it is actually really, really good. When you have no care for what goes to the graveyard because most of it comes back, that ability is definitely good. has a middle tick, which is a down tick of three. Each opponent sacrifices a creature with the highest power among creatures they control. I never really used that when I was testing. I know that it fits the theme of the deck, and I know it works because I've used it in other decks. However, for this deck, I did not get to test it because that putting stuff in your graveyard and into your hand was just too tempting and too good. And then it has an ultimate. Minus 8 it, and each opponent may discard a card. If they don't, they lose 3 life, and you repeat that process 6 times. Okay, I didn't use that either. I'm telling you, that uptick of plus one was just too good for this deck. So I'm hoping that they get a chance to test those two other abilities out. I didn't, but, you know, I also wasn't playing in a four-player pot. I was playing against some dumb computer just to see if the, del if the deck gelled together. All right. Last card before I go into the combo, because there's one more card for the deck. Mirror Shield. If you've seen any of my stuff in the last two or three weeks, I use this card a lot. It is my way to protect either your commander or any creature that's on the battlefield that you don't want to be targetable. It gives a creature plus zero, plus two. And hexproof. And then for some reason, this last one has not really been useful yet, but whenever a creature with death touch blocks or becomes blocked by this creature, destroy that creature. And it equips for two. It's just a way for me on a budget to give a creature something that almost is like Lightning Greaves, the eight or nine dollar card. So it was as close as I could get. Now, this last section that I'm going to go over, it's an infinite combo and has many things that you can do with the infinite, including the last card. So the last card I included was Ashnod's Altar. It's a 3 cast artifact that you can just sacrifice any creature to, to add 2 colors mana to your mana pool. Let me go over the different things that you can do here. So, with Pitiless Plunderer out, and I don't have a copy of it to show you, but I'll superimpose it on the side here. With Ashnod's Altar out, reassembling Skeleton, and then I'll superimpose Pitiless Plunderer because they already have it. What you have here is infinite mana. How it works is, with an, a reassembling Skeleton in play, you can sacrifice it if you have the Altar out to gain 2 colors. With Pitiless Plunderer in play, when a creature dies, you get a treasure token. You now have two colorless and a treasure token. It only costs one black and one of any to return reassembling skeleton to play. So that leaves you with an extra colorless because you're going to sack the treasure token for the black. That's infinite 
colorless mana. That's the first thing you can do. That also provides you with, if Sir Conrad is out, infinite leaves the graveyard abilities, infinite death triggers that will stack up a lot if Sir Conrad is in play. The last one, you're going to replace the reassembling skeleton, still keep the pitiless plunder and the astronaut's altar in play. Now, instead of gaining infinite mana, you're going to gain, you're going to have infinite death triggers, infinite leaves the graveyard triggers, infinite enters the, or uh, enters the graveyard triggers. So again, with Sir Conrad out, you're going to do it. And how it works is it's very similar to the reassembling skeleton, only now because you have to pay three to put it into play, you're not going to get the extra mana. So really good synergy for all around stuff with this deck. I really like the way that this deck plays. And there you have it, folks. Massacre Girl on a budget. While I was given a budget of up to $80, I didn't use the full amount. The actual amount of the cards came to roughly about $50. But since this is going to a fellow mod and friend of the channel, I only charged them $40. They also send me unwanted cards from their collection all the time that I use to make other decks so they get a discount on anything they order. Keep that in mind if you're on the fence about ordering a deck from me in the future. As far as the deck goes, I've been testing a modified version against Sparky on Arena just to see if it gels together correctly. I gotta tell you, it always has something to do. So if you ever want a deck that never has a dull moment, this is the build for you. Starting next week, I will be doing something I haven't had to do since I started making custom decks for people a couple of years ago. Lately, there have been a few people who have requested to purchase custom deck builds, and after completing the deck, those people have either ghosted me or changed their mind and decided not to go through with the sale. While that has been frustrating, I decided that since I already spent the time to make the decks, I would just modify the decks to fit into my $40 budget build Commander Precon offerings. So, over the next few weeks, the budget builds I will be releasing on the channel are a product of this unfortunate trend. That's all I've got for you this week. Thank you for watching, and as usual, if you have any comments, questions, suggestions, or concerns, or you just want to talk or chat about any of the videos I put out, you can do so using any of the methods I have displayed here. Additionally, if you would like to support the channel, you can do so in three ways. Donations are accepted and greatly appreciated. I have three methods with which you can do so displayed on the screen, and keep in mind that no amount is too small. If donations aren't your thing, and you would like to get something for your money, that's great too. I sell a lot of the decks I present on the channel, as well as mystery packs, so if you're interested in any of these, you can contact me using the information I have up on your screen right now. Directly contacting me is usually the best and cheapest way to do so, but you can always look at what I currently have available on the Facebook Marketplace. And lastly, if you want to show your love and support for the channel, but like myself, are a little strapped for cash, it doesn't cost you anything to subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so yet, watch some videos and give them a like, and possibly share them out on your social medias you use to help spread my content to more people. No matter what way you choose is greatly appreciated and will help support the channel, and I thank you for it. Sadly, that is all the time I have for this video. Thank you for watching, and please, stick around and watch some of the many great videos I've posted over the last few years, and remember to check back again for new content I'll be posting every week. Have a great day.